Hi, good morning. I'm Nakai, and I will be your service leader today. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. We encourage diversity and participation in our beloved community. Who you love, what you believe, wherever you are in your life journey, you are welcome here. We gather with gratitude this morning on Treaty 6 land. We share with many First Nations peoples. May we be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all our children. This service celebrates February's Black History Month with guest speaker Deborah Dobbins from the Shiloh Center for Multicultural Roots, sharing history of black settlers in Alberta. Our musicians today are the Pepper Seed Steel Orchestra, directed by my grandpa, Earl Ellis. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. The opening words will now be read by Romeo Hurst. Please read the words printed in italics. We come to this time and this place to rediscover the wondrous gift of a free religious community, to renew our faith in the holiness, goodness, and beauty of life, to reaffirm the way of to rekindle the flame of memory and hope, and to replace vision of an earth made fair and all people as one people. I now invite 
Riva wrestle to light our chalice while we speak these traditional words they are printed in your order of service love is the spirit of this church and service is its law we can from it well and hither to the truth and love help please turn to him 30 in the large hymn book This beloved community supports the operation of our church by regular donations and shares one half of the general collection with a charity outside our church. This month, the charity we are sharing with is iHuman Youth Society. Now please join me in listening to the steel... Yeah, let's listen to the pan for a minute. (laughs) Thank you. 
now please join me in singing from you I receive to you I give to receive the offering. to do him number 123 from the 123 I've got peace like a river It's our community question. Our question today is, what does racism mean to you, and when have you ever seen it happen? Just, come on, discuss. You can... everyone. Can I have your attention, please? (laughs) I shouldn't have asked. Okay. Now I invite Audrey Brooks up to introduce our guest speaker. I'll just give you a couple seconds more to settle down and behave yourselves. I first met Deborah at Shiloh Baptist Church about three years ago, I think it was. We were invited from the Edmonton Interface Center to participate in a series of workshops, and one of them was at Shiloh Baptist. I saw first saw part of the, the film that you're going to see here this morning, and I was absolutely amazed because I didn't know that we had black settlers all over Alberta I had heard of Amber Valley, but it was almost like um, just a casual passing of understanding that we did have black people. And, of course, John Ware, who was the famous uh, cowboy 
um, who lived near Calgary. So and then the other event was I had asked um, Deborah to come to the International Day for the Ending of Racial Discrimination, which happens on March the 21st every year. And she kindly came and absolutely uh, wowed all of the people that were there with the content of the film that you're going to see today. And she made the film, which is called We Are the Roots, the Black Settlers and Their Experience in the Canadian Prairies, experience of racial discrimination on the prairies as well. And believe me, believe it or not, this film has been awarded four different awards. The first one was the Heritage Award from the Historical Resources Foundation of Alberta and the Governor General's History Award for Excellence in Community Programming, Governor General's Award for Non-Print Format, and the Elizabeth Morton Award. The film was made in collaboration with uh, Jenna Bailey, Professor of History at the University of Lethbridge, and David Est from the University of Calgary Social Work. So welcome, Deborah. Thank you so much for coming and uh, bringing Elaine with you. (laughs) So good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm very happy to be here this morning to share just a little bit my history and our people's history with you today. My name is Deborah Dobbins. I am third generation African American Canadian descendant, born here in Edmonton. I have one sister and five living brothers. I'm a daughter, a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and a relative to many of the other African American Canadian descendants who settled here many years ago. I am a retired teacher administrator following the steps of five of my aunts on my dad's side. I have attended Shiloh Baptist since I was a preschooler and have been a member since my youth. I am here to share some history about my people, our roots, and our church community, Shiloh Baptist Church, who is a neighbor of the Unitarian Church. Slavery was officially abolished in the United States in 1865, but that did not end discrimination. The dominant race fought to keep their possession of their human property using any means possible, including unfathomed and inhumane tactics. By the late 1800s, southern states legitimized segregation and discrimination by creating anti-black laws like Jim Crow causing African Americans to be regarded as second and third class citizens. Intermarriage was prohibited. Every public place was segregated or had separate rules of etiquette. Constitutional right to vote and to own property was stripped away. Even access to drinking water and bathroom usage was unjustly regulated. Jim Crow and other such laws and unfair practices, including degrading, immoral, and unjustified lynch parties, made it unbearable and constantly dangerous for people of color. A mass exodus by African Americans from these states north to the Promised Land began, including all the way to Canada. In the early 1900s, the Canadian government advertised for settlers to pay a registration fee of $10 and receive 160 acres of land and homestead in Alberta and Saskatchewan and and other uh, prairie provinces. Invited black settlers came to the Canadian border by train from Texas, Oklahoma, Missouri, Illinois, Mississippi, and other southern states. For many of these settlers coming to Alberta, Canada meant freedom from the laws of segregation in the United States. Canada's laws protected them from slavery, but those laws were less effective against prejudice and oppression. The first main wave of black settlers came to Western Canada between approximately 1907 and 1914. They had responded to those advertisements, and when they tried to cross the border, they were not what the government had expected. They did meet all the requirements, though, so begrudgingly border agents had to let them enter. Hostile reactions erupted with the arrival of the African Americans and the racist backslash promoted by various leaders, the press, the business communities followed. By 1911, an official yet not formally enhanced order concerning African American exclusion 
immigration policies were put into place. This led to significantly reduced numbers of black people coming to Canada. My paternal grandparents came from Missouri and Illinois, respectfully. They too came because of the promise of owning land and living without prejudice because of the color of their skin. My grandmother was a teacher, but she couldn't teach in the United States. But she was able to teach her own children and other children on their Canadian homestead. Her five daughters all became teachers, and they fought many episodes of racial discrimination throughout their career with grace, still maintaining their dignity as they taught both in rural and urban schools here in the province of Alberta. My maternal grandparents came from Texas and Oklahoma. Now, both sets of grandparents settled in Junkins. Today, it's known as Wildwood, the place where my parents were born and raised. Junkins was the first established black settlement formed in the early years of the development of the province of Alberta. The four other noted African-American settlements were Amber Valley, which you've already heard about, Camp C, which is very close to Barhead, and Keystone, which is now Breton. Those are the Alberta ones, and Maidstone in southwest, kind of southwest, Saskatchewan. My maternal grandfather always trusted in God and was never seen without his Stetson hat. He picked cotton, worked many fields, and eventually escaping the dangers of the South. One day at the age of 15, his uncle strongly ordered him to run. Something terrible had happened, and the white man was coming for retribution. My grandpa had to leave immediately from the fields and not look back for fear of being killed. He was on his own from then on, working as a cowboy throughout the states. No, he wasn't John Ware, but he is pretty close to it. He was tall, light-skinned, southern drawled, proud Texan, and he had to pass as Mexican, as a Mexican worker many times in order to survive the hostile environments. Well, he ended up in California. He married my Oklahoman-born grandmother in 1915, and they made their way up into Alberta via Nebraska. Stetson, Bandana, and Bolero were my grandpa's trademarks up until he passed away at the age of 101 in March 1991. At first it was clear he pointed out to the immigration black settlers that they were not wanted in Western Canada. Still, even though it meant encountering prejudice and hardships, they came this far by faith. The black community always put God first in their lives. He faithfully had brought them through many trials, adversities, joys, and they knew to give him the praise at all times. Shiloh Baptist Church was officially formed in 1910 and recorded as such on July 9, 1910 in the Edmonton Daily Bulletin. Prior to the official title, Families would meet in the homes for church because they always put God first in their lives. He faithfully had brought them through many trials, adversities, joys, and they knew to give him the praise, like I've already said, and it doesn't hurt to keep saying it. Give him the praise at all times. Finally, they were able to establish a more permanent place of worship and have a welcoming place for persons of color. That's what they called us back then, to gather to worship, as other existing churches in Edmonton did not allow them to join their congregation. Historians have noted that the role of the church in education, in building trades, as social business, and political forum, it was concert hall, art gallery, and theater, all of those things helped to nurture cultural talents and give a safe place for the voice of the community to grow and be heard. It was the community center and the place for organized activities like sports and culture and religious and social activities for individuals who were not generally accepted as members of the wider community. And that occurred for many years. It needs to be noted that both covert and overt practices of discrimination, prejudice, and marginalization ran rampant for many years. The KKK raised its head in Alberta in the early 1920s, and finally, in the 60s, 
Finally, immigration restrictions were lifted. People of the Caribbean were um, invited to come to Canada in the beginning in the 1960s. And then I'm, I'm, I understand that in the 1970s, then the, the immigration was opened more to the African diaspora. Shiloh was initially Edmonton's only community hub and church for the first black settlers, their families, and anyone else who had no public place they felt welcome in. Shiloh served as a place of bonding for the people. This shared bond through the community and congregation helped them endure and even strive for social justice. Cobbs, Houston, Brooks, Slaughter, Lewis, Coleman, Smith, King, Proctor, Knight, Allen, Jones, Crump, Utendale, Fears, Adams, Anderson, Bailey, Walker, Leffler are all the names found in some of the oldest recorded books in Shiloh's archives dating back to 1924. And I would just like to highlight a few of those family farm families. Now, the Walker family name is on the early 1920s church roster. Not only were the Walkers active in the church, but also in Edmonton community, working and lobbying for equal rights for all citizens. Born in January 25, 1882, Ernest Lehman Walker came to Canada in the early 1900s from Troy, Missouri. He didn't come to Homestead like many of the other black pioneers, but came to work on the Dunbegin Railroad line as a porter. Mr. Ernie Walker was a church deacon, actively working to provide financial assistance and support to newcomers to Edmonton and to the church. Rosa Lietta Lane, born in March 25, 1917, was one of the first Canadian-born Oklahomans after her family arrived in Maidstone, Saskatchewan around 1910. Rosie moved to Edmonton in her early 20s in order to find work and support her family back in Saskatchewan. She soon became an active member of Shiloh Baptist Church, working with the ladies' ministry, cutting bandages and other needed items for the Red Cross. She cooked for the legendary church chicken suppers, hosted dinners, and welcomed many of the ministers in Shiloh's history. She cared for the sick, visited the shut-ins, and provided donations to the families in need. Now, Gladys Leffler, niece Smith, their mo- her mother and grandparents had roots in Tennessee, Missouri, and Oklahoma. They came to Edmonton after the Jim Crow law in Oklahoma came into effect. Her father, Edward Smith, came to Edmonton from Washington State to purchase a homestead in Camp C, just north of Barhead. Whenever families came to Edmonton, Shiloh continued to be their church home. And in the early years, the small church was a major hub for Edmonton's black settlers. Not only Edmonton's black settlers, but all of the other five, the, the five settlements around Edmonton. They would always come when they came to Edmonton at Shiloh, was the community hub and um, the place of worship. Mark Lewis's grandparents, African-American Canadians, came to Edmonton in the early 1900s. His mother, Ruth, was born here in Canada. Mark's grandfather used to preach at the first church, the converted blacksmith shop. And the following is just an excerpt from an interview with Mark back in 2012. He said, in the States, they had escaped a lot of real prejudice down there. But it was subtler here, but it still existed. I think that the black church found refuge in the church. They felt comfort amongst their own people, Mark said. He also said, Shiloh was a place of strength and solitude, a ray of light in sometimes painful experience. Now those are just a few examples to hopefully give you a glimpse into the fact that Shiloh Baptist Church served as a community, as a social place, a spiritual place for the African-American Canadian Albertan pioneers when they first came to help lay the foundation and the development of our province. Shiloh Baptist congregation moved through five locations in history, starting with the converted blacksmith shop, which the members of the congregation cleaned, took down many partitions, and made it into one large multi-purpose room. It was organized under the leadership of Reverend R.L. Knight, a missioner from Toronto, on July 10th, like I said, and it was known as the first colored Baptist church in Western Canada. 
Many student pastors in training at the North American Baptist College here in Edmonton got their first experience working with a multicultural congregation by doing their practicum at Shiloh Baptist Church. The Shiloh Women's Auxiliary supported many missions and missionaries. The church was never a wealthy organization and still isn't today, but the congregation was giving and sharing with one another at all times. To this day, they still continue to help those in need. Now, that pictured chair was regularly used in the early church building. It was wired together with other similar chairs to form pews for everyone to sit on during the services. That particular chair, which is, whoops, there it is, um, it dates back to the early 1920s when the church congregation moved in about 1921 from its original location at 638 Clark Street to its second location on 93rd Street and 105th Avenue. The Shiloh congregation grew in size and multicultural makeup due to being a welcoming place for everyone. Many interracial marriages occurred at the church, and those couples remained in the church, raising their children there. The congregation made another move to 66th Street and on 124th Avenue in the 50s, purchasing the North Edmonton Mission Church building, which is located right across the street from, um, anyone remembers Swift's Packing Plant? Okay, we were just right, a, yeah, yes, Vern was around the corner, Smith was across the street. And um, a lot of our um, men were able to find work there at the packing plant or be porters because um, they weren't allowed to work in any, really, uh, any other blue, higher blue collar jobs or never in any white collar jobs back then. So during the week, senior, junior, and children's choirs were developed, and they practiced and sang along with Bible study and prayer meetings. Friday nights were reserved for the young people group, and on some Saturdays there was sold-out fried chicken dinners hosted by the WA, Women's Auxiliary. Sunday mornings were for Sunday school of all ages, starting first and finishing up before the 11 o'clock church start time. The church building was located, like I said, across the street. Now, the early church was more than a place for church renewal. These men could also meet at the church on occasion to discuss working conditions, other city labor issues, thus forming various organizations and committees. A Sunday school bus was purchased in the mid-60s because of the donation and resourcefulness of key members of the church. So children from Jasper Place to Northeast Edmonton could all get to Sunday school each week. Now, Mrs. Nellie Brown was one of the first ones picked up, and she became the mother to all the kids that rode on the bus to make sure that they stayed in their seats and um, were nice to each other. So by 8.30 in the morning, and after many stops along the way to pick the riders up in the east, the bus would proceed back to the church in time for the 9.45 start of Sunday school. Now, the drive home after church with a busload of hungry children required a lot of patience on the part of everyone. There was always an important stop along the route to get a box of Ritz crackers, something that was affordable and plentiful to ensure that each rider got at least one piece of something to hold him over till they got home. And I rode that bus, so sometimes that one cracker, you know, take a little tiny bite, chew it up really good, because you know you had another hour or so on that bus before you could <laughs> get home and eat. Now, the weekly ride on that sometimes crowded bus brought the black community children together. Strong bonds were made during those rides. Those bonds still remain today among the adults who had the opportunity to be immersed in their culture and share it with the children who were just like them. Music has constantly played an important part not only in the church but through the ages. Lyrics and sounds were embedded with hidden messages for a group of people who needed a way to communicate without being noticed by their enslavers as they sang what is now referred to as spirituals. Gospel music rooted in the American South combines traditional African rhythms entwined with jazz and blues and Christian lyrics. Shiloh Baptist services were filled with this type of music along with the traditional Christian songs sang by many others in other churches. Many talented singers and musicians began their careers singing in Sunday school or even during church service at Shiloh. To name one such group, the Troubadours, 
Edmonton's first black all-male gospel singers made an album in the early 1960s, and all of those members regularly attended Shiloh. The Shiloh Choir has been singing for almost 100 years. They have pretty, not members, not one member for 100 years. <laughs> Um, they have participated in events such as K-Days, the, the Sunday Promenade, Martin Luther King Day, Celebration Mustard Seed Church, Benefit Concerts, Jazz Festival, and even the Windspear pre-opening gala. They have sang at the Fringe during Black History Month concerts, charitable events, city cultural events, and other church concerts, senior home visits, weddings, funerals, in addition to hosting their own gospel concerts and events. And I just happened to be at every one, one of those because I was in the choir for forever, and I still am. Continued growth in an ethnicity representation, economic improvements, and congregation dynamics made it possible to upgrade to a larger building with the purchase of Erskine United Church on 115th Avenue and 94th Street in the early 70s. And then on to its present location in the late 80s, the church of past Premier Manning's church, Emmanuel Baptist Church, were now located at 107th Avenue and 114th Street. Shallow began a new era in the 80s. Pastors from a variety of cultures and countries and situations helped shape the growth and overall dynamics. Numbers increased and decreased and increased again. Members came and went and returned. Styles of services and offered experiences were provided and challenged. There were changing looks, dynamics, and locations, but... Through it all, there was never a change in God's response. Throughout Shiloh's journey, God has been good. Now we say it, Shiloh. I'm going to see if you all say it here. God is good? God is good. Nope, sorry. (laughs) Okay, so you're going to say, at all times. Okay, and then I'll say something else, and you'll say, God is good. Okay, here we go. God is good at all times, and at all times, God is good. He sure is. Now, throughout each transition, the church continued faithfully believing in God's plan for his people. Through the good, the trying, the adverse, and sometimes unsure times, God has never failed to provide for his people. Shiloh is known to sing with conviction. The old gospel song, We've Come This Far By Faith. Anyone know that song? Oh, 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 come on up here and sing it with me. Come on. No, oh, sorry. <laughs> We've come this far by faith. Leaning on the Lord. Trusting in His holy word. He's never failed me yet. And oh, can't turn around. We've come this far. And then you'll hear the rest of Shiloh if ever you come. (laughs) All right. Even though Shiloh Baptist Church is highly recognized as a church deeply rooted in African-American beginnings, also known as black church, From its inception, all persons, regardless of race, are welcome to join the membership and take active roles in the church organization. Each year, Shiloh continues to celebrate Black History Month and remember the journey by faith of their original members. Shiloh will celebrate its 109th year in July. As expressed in a quote from Shiloh's oldest member, who recently passed away at the age of 102, she said, Through it all, God kept the doors of the church open, and his word continues to be the guiding light. I totally agree with her words. There are many descendants and their families still living and thriving here in Alberta and throughout Canada. The African diaspora and Caribbean Canadians represented presence in Alberta has greatly increased since the 1960s. The black Canadians are represented at an increasing rate in every area of today's working force, in business and commerce, educational institutions, various levels of government, public facilities and neighborhoods and other places where we were not welcome at one time. 
We have come this far in spite of all of the past and unfortunately still present societal adversities and inequities. Let us all work towards equality, fairness, and justice, not only during Black History Month, but during every month of the year. Now, I have the privilege of being the founding director of Shiloh Center for Multicultural Roots, a not-for-profit organization which represents the people of the early immigration era from the United States. In 2018, SCMR completed an 18-month human rights project which resulted in lots of excellent data and uh, of research and findings, and also the production of We Are the Roots documentary. Please watch, not the whole thing because it's over an hour long, but watch the following short trailer. And if you're interested in learning a bit more about the people who helped settle the prairies in the early 1900s and their experiences of being black in Canada, the full version is available for viewing online at www.baileyandsoda.com, all one word. So thank you very much for allowing me to share a part of my African-American Western history and for being here this morning. We will now have the trailer, please. Thank you. There was a call out from Canada to the United States for uh, people to come and homestead here in Alberta. They put us in places where they thought we'd never succeed, you know, small settlements, but in spite of, we succeeded. It was some hard times. You had to clear so much land every year. And all they had was horses and oxen to work with. What I did all my life at that time was housework. We had such a hard time because nobody wanted us to progress. If you started to show any progress, you'd lose a job. Even if you had uh, reasonable skills, it was still hard to get a job, you know, just because of race. I, get, I think for us, it's just, it's part of our lives, right? It's part of what makes us strong people. We just want to tell our story and the struggles that we had and to make sure that our history isn't forgotten. Now, we will listen to the Pepper Seed Steel Orchestra play Packabell.
Thank you very much. All right, Deacon. I will now read the... When all the people of the world love, then the strong will not overpower the weak. The many will not be cruel or enslave the people. The rich people will not make sign of the poor. The ones who are powerful will not overpower others. The politicians will not deceive the people. This is what can happen when all people of the world learn love. Thank you, Deacon. I would like to thank our volunteers today. Coffee, we have Claire Horn doing greetings with Karen Belinda. Ushering was Barbara Forbes. Piano was Karen Mills. Sound tech was Bill Lee. And then also the soup Sunday makers would like to thank you guys. And then also, again, the Pepper Seed Steel Orchestra. Thank you guys for coming out. And special thanks to Deborah Dobbins for her many years of unfailing activism on behalf of our black sisters and brothers and to the Shiloh Baptist Church, which has been have a heaven and community center for them. Uh, and now we will listen to the postlude. Pepper Seed Steel Orchestra.
Great, thank you. Now let's join hands and sing our closing song.